Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, today is May 26, 2019. Uh, we've had a lot of storms here in the Midwest. If you've uh, followed that on the news, uh, some major flooding and tornadoes in our area. Uh, just ask that you keep Oklahoma and, and all the rest of the heartland in your prayers. I was asked to do something uh, by one of our followers and so I decided it was important enough to do that and so I'm going to take a slight detour here before we enter into the 11th chapter of Romans so this is for none but the hungry heart uh, many people would find what I'm about to present uh, somewhat uh, boring dry I believe it's important that we define uh, certain specific biblical terms. And so I've made a, a list here of a few that I'm going to go over and talk to, with you about. I think they're extremely important as it relates to our study uh, and as it relates to our, our walk in Christ in, in general. Uh, vitally important. In fact, so vitally important that without a, a proper understanding of these definitions, you know, we tend to to actually lose a, a lot. Uh, we don't really gain very much from what the Holy Spirit intended that we know and understand. So, naturally, uh, I'm going to start at the top of the list, and I'm going to talk about redemption. Now, if you follow this channel, you know that uh, this this ministry. Uh, has a somewhat un unorthodox view concerning the matter of redemption. Uh, that's putting it somewhat mildly. It's We don't hold to the mainstream view that we do anything to be born again, but that, that quickening to life is a work uh, of God, and it's according to the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Let's look at the biblical definition of, of redemption. Okay, the word is, uh, in the Greek text, the word is ek sagarazo. Uh, the word literally means to buy up, ransom. Uh, ransom is probably the best uh, short definition of the word redemption. To rescue from loss. Uh, rescue completely out from which which intensifies the ek is out out from and the agarazzo is the uh, is to buy up uh, to buy up at the marketplace it's uh so it intensifies the ek out from uh, intensifies agarazzo to buy up at the marketplace it properly means to take full advantage of seizing a buying opportunity if you've ever uh, been to a flea market or an auction and you decide that you uh, you have to have uh, something that's being auctioned off or something that is for sale and you just have to have it and so you purchase it it's a, a release affected by payment of ransom redemption uh, uh, deliverance uh, it's uh, the it's it's a buying back from it's a repurchasing winning back what was pre uh, previously lost previously forfeited and we did not initiate this transaction it was done at the cross and the price of course was Jesus's blood Romans three twenty four being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There was no synergism involved. None whatsoever. Now, I want to take a slight sort of, a, you know, off the beaten path, off tr off trail, uh, off the, the normally uh, given thought here concerning, now I, I believe this absolutely pertains to redemption, but I want to remind you of Acts chapter 2, folks. Acts chapter 2. 
if we turn to Acts chapter 2 and we begin looking at verse 37, we read, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye, ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now when we take serious note of the definition of the words used in the text, then we get the right picture of what was going on. Repent means to change your mind. It's a change of mind. And be baptized, that is, become identified with, into the name of Jesus Christ. The baptism there has no relationship whatsoever to water. It is being identified with Christ. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So it's change your mind, be baptized, or become identified with, into the name of of Jesus Christ, Christ being the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, which they would have understood, Peter's listeners would have understood, and you will receive, that is, you will welcome the Holy Spirit, which they would have had to have already received, otherwise they could not have believed. I say that boldly because the rest of Scripture confirms the fact that, as Jesus said, the reason that you do not believe is because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would believe. We, folks, believe, new birth precedes faith. Faith follows new birth. We have to be made alive first. The old man, the sin nature, the Adamic nature, the flesh cannot it, do anything. There's no profit. It's unprofitable. There's no profit in the flesh. The flesh is incapable. A dead man, a spiritually dead man, which is what we were before we were quickened to life, cannot receive, believe, repent, be baptized, or anything else. This is a call out to God's people. I, I, I want to impress heavily upon you the fact that what we're looking at here is a picture of where the when in, in simply looking at the definition of the terms, which is what we're going to be doing in this in this video, Peter's message of of repentance was change your mind and be baptized, become identified with into the name of Jesus Christ, and which they would have understood as the Messiah. And you will receive, you will receive, that is, you'll welcome the Holy Spirit. Change your mind, Peter says. Change your mind. I want you to stop and think about that. Change your mind. Peter is telling his Jewish listeners to change their minds about something. That is, from what they had learned through Moses and the law. And these Jews must have said, and, you know, I, I, I throw this out there, uh, carefully. Of course, no one knows. No, none. We don't have any testimony as to what what they said, what they thought specifically here. But they must have have thought, "You got to be kidding." Change my mind. I mean, this was Jesus of Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Change your mind from what they had previously understood through Moses and the law. And we see in the first evangelistic message ever given, God's sovereign election, which strangely Christians by the millions reject outright as and label it as heresy. Stop and let that think in, uh, sink in. Stop and just stop and let that sink in for a moment. The first evangelistic message ever given through Peter to Jewish 
converts, God's people, whom he had prepared beforehand, predestined, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, those who would hear the message, the call goes out to, to his sheep, his people, and in that very first, very first evangelistic message ever given, you see the sovereign election of God. We tend to, to skip over that. We don't, we, t we don't tend to notice that as we're reading through the text. But I, I'm not going to make this up, folks. Go to the text and look and see. For the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise is unto you, Peter says, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The chapter concluding with, this is how chapter 2 of Acts concludes. It concludes with the words, and the Lord added, the Lord added. They didn't add themselves. The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. I didn't write that. I didn't write that. That's what the text says such as should be saved. It doesn't say such as would be saved, who wanted to be saved, such as should be saved. I want you to understand, folks, that the first Passover, the firstborn son didn't do anything. It was the father that applied the blood over the doorpost. The kid must have said, Dad, are you sure I want to be fine? Yeah, yeah, son, you'll be fine. I, I put blood over the doorpost and the lentils. You'll be fine. You're going to wake up in the morning. Now, it didn't matter if the firstborn son believed that or not. It didn't even, it didn't even matter if he believed his father or not. What mattered was whether the, was whether the blood was applied over the doorpost. This is, we're talking about the first Passover, folks. First Passover. Leviticus 23. We talked a lot about that back when we were heavily into the, the prophecy uh, construct of everything. Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, we, know, we know these things. Folks, we know this stuff. Only the high priest, who was a type of Christ, our high priest could enter into the inner sanctuary with blood to offer atonement. And keep in mind that's there was a temporary covering. This had to this had to, to be repeated every year for the sins of himself and the people. And no others could enter, or they would be cut off from among the people especially if they did any work on that day. Wow. Okay, listen, folks. Why was this? Not only could they not enter into the sanctuary, they were commanded by God to do no work on that day. Are you getting this? Did you get that? Why was that? Why did God command no work be done on that day? Have you given any serious thought to that? Why was that? I'll tell you why that was. It was because redemption is solely the work of God. It can't be, it can't, God doesn't need any help. It can't, no, no others are involved. Christ only is involved. He's, he's, we were solely born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh. It, and it was a shadow of what was to come. So, as much as I'd like to continue on talking about redemption, which is because that word redeemed is probably the most precious word in my vocabulary. We'll go on. Justification. We've talked a lot about that over the past, uh, oh, I don't know, 60 some odd videos in Romans, 30 some odd videos in Ephesians. The word means to show and declare righteous, to make righteous, defend the cause of, plead for the righteousness, the innocence of someone. 
to acquit, to regard as righteous, to declare to be righteous, because one has been made righteous. And I pointed out in the past the fact that God can't call something good that's, that's evil, and he can't call something evil that's, that's good. If he calls us righteous, it's because he's made us righteous. He could do nothing else. In our case, being made the very righteousness of God in Christ. That's a heart stopper. I think about that constantly every day of my life, that I've, I am, I've been made the very righteousness of God in Christ, that that is how he looks at me. When the Father looks down at me, he sees me as righteous as his son. Oh, how many Christians need to know that? I, I long ago stopped, really stopped asking myself, you know, why aren't so many pulpits preaching this? God has the answer to that, and that is not my job to try and figure that out. My job is to, to tell you the truth as best as I know how, and not understanding that no one has a handle on the truth, folks. I do, I do my best. I do my best to, to just bring out from the text what is there. We call it exegesis, not read anything into it. Eisegesis. But simply deal honestly with the text, and defining these terms is vitally important. We need to know that we've been justified. The word is, is uh, it's, well, it's actually a compound word. It's from, it's from decay, decay. That's not decay as in something going bad. It's, it's the Greek word, decay. Right. Judicial approval. We were made, uh, Righteous by the obedience of Christ, just as we were made sinners by the disobedience of Adam. Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace. Being justified freely by his grace. We didn't do anything to become righteous. Through the redemption, and we just got through talking about that, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There was no synergism involved in either. So now I want to I touch a little bit on the word regeneration. Regeneration. It's not often uh, uh, mentioned a lot because uh, normally uh, we speak of regeneration in, 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 the, in the term uh, born again. Uh, born again is a favorite phrase. More accurate phrase would be born from above. But the word regeneration means to made alive together with. Born again, birth, renewal, quickened to life. Because we were spiritually dead, we were unable to respond. We were not loving or seeking God. The text makes it absolutely clear. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, the price that he paid, while we were still his enemy. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. The word is uh, palagan, palaganesia from 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 Palin, again, in Genesis, birth, beginning, uh, so properly it's born again. Dead men do not resurrect themselves to life, not one ever has. Even the Father rose Jesus from the dead. We were born again by the will of God, not the will of the flesh or the will of man. John 1, 13, a bedrock truth in my life. Modern evangelism would have us believe that we're born again by our own will, according to our own will, which is absolutely diametrically opposed to what the text says. They have turned the text around 180 degrees to say, that we are born again by our, according to our own will, when the text clearly says we're born again not by our own will, but by the will of God. 
John 5.21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. 1 Corinthians 1.30, another favorite verse of mine, But by his doing are you in Christ Jesus. First time I ever read that, my heart stopped, I think. Well, actually, it must not have, because I'm still here. But it must have surely skipped a beat. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. How could anyone possibly misconstrue that verse? Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Reconciliation. The word means to decisively change as when two parties reconcile when coming uh, or changing to the same position. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God, that's when we were reconciled to God, is when we were enemies of God. It's obvious we didn't do this. By the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's saved, delivered by his life. And the word is katalasso. It's from kata down to an exact point, And alasso to change. So properly it, it means decisive change. To change from enmity to friendship. To reconcile. God reconciled us to himself by the death of his son, and as a result, uh, we'll be saved by his life. And there was no synergism in this. God did it. God did it. And then there's that word that m many Christians just find, I don't know, they just, I've known Christians to absolutely ignore this word for, for some odd reason. Maybe it's because of how it's pronounced. Maybe it's because of how it's spelled. Propitiation. Maybe it's because it's just not a word that we, we tend to use in our, in our own everyday uh, vocabulary. We don't go around talking about propitiation. But it is a crucially... Uh, important, very important word. A sacrificial offering to satisfy an offended party. It's basically what the word means. The word is uh, hilasterion. A sin offering by which the wrath of the deity shall be appeased. Romans 3, 24 and 25 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Satisfaction. That's what the word means. God is satisfied. Isaiah 53, 11, You've heard me quote this a number of times. He shall see the travail of of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities absolutely no synergism in this and for those of you who are still kind of new to the word synergism because you uh, you may hear me refer to that word a lot it's basically uh, cooperative Synerg synergism, synergistic, it's cooperative activity between man and God. It's God and man getting together uh, and working together to bring about a purpose. No synergism. No synergism, folks, in any of this. And then we come to the next word on my list, glorified, Romans 8.30. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, that is predetermined, foreordained, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So, 
glorification is defined as an opinion determining true value. It's, it's what you would estimate some, something's worth. It's, it's how you would go about esti giving your, expressing your estimation of something's worth or someone's worth, the value of someone or the value of something. That's what glorify means. An estimation of true worth. The word is doxa, properly to ascribe weight by recognizing real substance or real value. So in speaking of God's glory, which we often do, you hear Christians talking about the glory of God all the time, God's glory. Uh, it means valuing him for who he truly is. Giving or ascribing glory to God personally acknowledges God in his true character, his true essence. Thus, by glorifying us, which is the reverse, God values us for who we really are, who we truly are, just as we value God for who he really is. So that's the word glorified. And then we come to the matter of faith, and that is, a, well, it's about a year-long study. There's so much that can be said about that. It's, it's unreal. Belief. Faith is belief. Specific faith, belief, is invested by God in measure, according, this is what many Christians fail to, to, to realize or understand. It's invested by God in our lives, in measure, according to our present need at any given moment, at any given time. Romans 12, 3. And Holy Spirit illumination is required, Ephesians 1, 18. His timing as it pertains to our particular growth uh, is a factor. We don't drum up that faith on our own, despite what, what most Christians believe. We don't manufacture that on our own. We don't drum it up on our own. Faith comes through the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. We know that. We know the source from which it comes. Righteousness comes through no other means. In fact, it is faith's righteousness. You see the, the genitive there, the righteousness of faith, faith's righteousness. That's Romans 10, 6. It's trusting in God, not simply, not simply believing something true about God. I've known many people that do. They're not really trusting God. They're, they're believing something concerning, oh, I believe God. Uh, yeah, I believe Jesus raised from the dead. It's the fact that they're, that they're believing in. They're not believing in the God concerning the fact. There's a, there's a big difference here. I hope you get that. God is the, is the object. He, Christ is the object of our faith. And so... Propositional, what we call propositional revelation, is to be distinguished between illumined revelation. You can you can read and you can gain a lot of knowledge. That's propositional revelation. What the Holy Spirit decides, determines, wills, you know, to reveal uh, to you, illumine to you. That is truth that, or that you come to understand it as God understands it. It's uh, in theological realms, we refer to that as illumined revelation. So it's to be distinguished from mere knowledge, mere propositional revelation. It's our responsibility to study, whereby we gain propositional revelation. And by doing that, we open ourselves up to the, the potential of illumined revelation understanding what God has said perfectly as he himself understands it. It's a work of the Holy Spirit, our one teacher, John 14 and John 15, both. Both chapters, you'll, you'll see that he is our one teacher. I don't teach you folks anything. I'm, I may throw out a whole lot of, this is a good example, I may throw out a whole lot of a good uh, propositional revelation, or I may not. But it is the Holy Spirit that illumines, that opens your heart, your mind, to understand this as he understands it. And when he does that, faith is invested in your life. And then the exercise of that faith produces the righteousness of God. 
the righteousness of God based on faith. That's our works. And it's and it's a very beautiful arrangement. Fantastic formula. So let's move on to sanctification. That's that's to set apart as holy. First uh, Corinthians six eleven and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. First Corinthians one thirty is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness, holiness. The word holiness is the word sanctified and redemption Ephesians 5:26 to sanctify her cleansing her by the washing with water through the word 1 Thessalonians 5 and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ Ephesians 5:27 that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Colossians 1, 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and blameable and unreprovable in his sight, something that I'm often fond of quoting. And this he will do. God is faithful, and he will do it. This is the work, folks, of the potter over the clay. No synergism. God did it, and he did it through his son, Jesus Christ. He set us apart as holy because that is what we are. I often uh, enjoy pointing out to Christians that I meet how that when you go set about reading the, epist the epistles, uh, John uh, uh, Paul's epistles in particular almost at the at the opening of every one of Paul's epistles you'll note that we are called saints that's what we're called righteous holy and uh, I find that just that one fact alone amazing when, when you have millions upon millions upon millions of Christians walking around with their heads down Worried about whether they're saved or not. Worried about whether they're forgiven or not. Uh, you tell them they're a saint. You tell them that they're righteous. That as righteous as, as God's son. They've been made righteous. Declared righteous. And they don't know this. Perhaps they've never been told this. Perhaps they've brushed across that. Reading through the, the word. And they've, they've read that. Uh, where they were called saints. And, and it just doesn't really, I don't know, maybe that's illumined revelation, you know, as opposed to propositional revelation. You can read it and it and it be propositional revelation. It takes the Holy Spirit to illumine that truth to, to the heart. And it could very well be that, that it's a matter of, of heart hunger involved. This is why I said this is kind of for none but the hungry heart. Those who aren't serious about this stuff, folks, they, they won't care about this, and they won't get any of this. Their minds are elsewhere. So let's talk about adoption. Adoption, legally made a member of God's family. The word is, is uh, 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 huiothesia in the Greek. Divine adoption. It's kind of got an H sound in front. Or Esia. Ephesians 1 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. The word itself excludes any notion, just the very word. Pushes out any any idea that we adopted ourselves. This adoption is related to predestination, Christ's finished work, and God's sovereign will and good pleasure. 
And then there's, uh, of course, the word election. Simply means to elect, means to choose. Just like in, in school where they, they chose up teams and you got elected, you know, to one side of the team or the other. John 15, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit. Ephesians 1, 11. In whom also we have obtained an, an inheritance, bring, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. We have obtained an inheritance is one word in the Greek. Just one word. It's, uh, it's uh, kleru. It's from kleros. They cast lots like they did for Jesus' garments. We, we have obtained an inheritance is one word. We have obtained, that's five words in the, in the English, one word in the Greek. To cast lots. It's to make a choice when assisted by casting lots. To, to appoint, assign, by lot casting. That's what the word means. The Greek text literally reads, In whom Christ, that is Christ, indeed we were lot cast, having already been already been pre-horizoned, that's pro horizo and it's an aorist participle, according to divine purpose of the one energizing all things according to the counsel arising from his will, leaving no doubt whatsoever that divine election is not a matter related to Israel only, but to the church as well. And then we have the word forgiveness. And, oh, how so many Christians don't even know that they've been forgiven. It word means to be pardoned by grace, or given grace to pardon. That's if it's used in the context, context of ourselves, forgiving others. Colossians 2.13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all Trespasses. The word forgiven is charizomai from, from charis, grace, extending favor, uh, to extend favor, freely give favor, to grant forgiveness or pardon. Favor that cancels is used of God giving his grace to pardon. This is freely done and therefore not based on any merit, no human merit. Of the one receiving forgiveness and contrary to popular belief under this present dispensation of grace this complete forgiveness is not a forgiveness and this may shock people it's not a forgiveness that we ask for we were forgiven you can thank him thank God that you were forgiven now, I'm not talking about the uh, 1 John 1 9 confession, which is not ask either. It's saying the same thing that God says about our sin. The word confess, I'm a legeo, and I've touched on that before too. That's another entire study in and of itself. It's agreeing with God concerning what he says about our sin, and if we do that, we have fellowship with one with another. Here in Colossians, it's full forgiveness. All our trespasses, he nailed them to his tree. There was no synergism involved. Uh, we didn't ask for it. In fact, you know, we were, as I pointed out, we were his enemies. He redeemed us, died in our place, became our substitute, he justified us, made us righteous when we were his enemy. Of 23 occurrences, I believe, in the New Testament, there, there doesn't exist a verse, I, I've yet to find it in 30-some-odd years, where the, this forgiveness is conditional or dependent upon one asking for it. it. It's just not there. This forgiveness was included in God's grace, which was associated with our redemption, which was by grace, he having died in our place. 
this word charizomai, it literally means to exercise grace, to freely show favor. Graciously bestow. So you, you won't find one verse post-Calvary. I'm talking about after the cross. Because keep in mind, before the cross, there was not a single Christian alive. And even in Jesus' uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, you know, where you're looking at, at kingdom teaching. He was still offering himself as king, offering the kingdom, which we know he, they rejected. And so you're going to see in the, in the Gospels there, you're going to see a lot of, of conditional phrases. But you have to understand that in rightly dividing the Word of God, that we have to distinguish between these dispensations. Same same thing is true about the tribulation period. Right now, folks, there are people that are alive among us, Christians, who are walking around quoting, uh, let me see, how can I put this? We have Christians today who are applying kingdom age teaching to their lives or tribulation period teaching to their lives. Uh, they actually literally believe that if you're, you know, your right hand offend, offends you, it's best to cut it off. You know, that, they take that quite literally. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to dispensationalism. God has d distinguished different programs as far as redemption goes for his people throughout different periods, time periods in history. We are the church, folks. We're unique. We're living in a period in which God is not even, even imputing men's trespasses against them. We are in between what was preached prior to the cross, which was the kingdom, started with John the Baptist. And when the church is gone, I want you this fact, uh, I hope this fact does not escape your notice, that when the church is gone, the two witnesses pick up, once again, preaching the same message John the Baptist preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And here we are in the middle. And a lot of these verses in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, you're going to find even some in, very few in John, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you're going to find that these verses that seem to contradict what Paul is teaching or that Paul in, in what he's teaching you'll see there is no condition nothing is conditional there's no synergism involved but you go back to Matthew Mark and Luke when the, the kingdom was being preached and all of a sudden well that's just not the case this was before Acts, before Pentecost, before there was a church. There wasn't a Christian alive. If you don't make that distinction, you're going to be, well, you're just going to be confused. Repentance. That's another word. I just want to touch, I've touched on it a little bit, but as I said, it's a change of mind. Met, metanoia. 2 Corinthians 17, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. That's salvation. That's not redemption. He's speaking to God, to his own people. God's Holy Spirit is speaking to his people. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So it's probably one of the most misunderstood words in all the Bible, repentance. Uh, it's, a, it's a very lengthy study in and of itself. Of course, all of these words are. But what in, in, in Acts 3, Acts chapter 3, where the, what Peter conceives is that if God's people Israel, his brethren, repents, then there will come at once those times of refreshing, those blessed days of righteousness, peace, rest, and universal joy, which are the characteristics of Christ's kingdom as foretold by the prophets. 
And uh, I've got another verse here in Second Peter uh, three, Second Peter three nine. The context of the church, this change of mind, is related to the timing of Christ's return, or that none of His people perish, which none will. And in Revelation chapter three, the word is addressed to the church at Laodicea because of the message that is being preached, which the Lord finds unrefreshing and will spew out of his mouth. In Acts 2, 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But don't stop reading. Verse 38, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So we see that repentance is related to election, being children of promise. And then one favorite subject of mine is, is baptism. It's identification. The word baptism means identification. It's baptizo in the Greek, all right? Uh, means, the word means to be identified with. Romans 6.3 Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. The word baptized means identified with. Galatians 3.27 For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. 1 Corinthians 12.13 For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Romans 6, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And, of course, uh, everybody's, most everybody's familiar with Galatians 2.20. Crucified with Christ. Uh, it's, I am crucified with him. We, we've, been, we've been identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Identification. And as the knowledge, and I can't be, I, I hope you don't miss this. As the knowledge that Christ died for you and me, for our sin. Just as that is indispensable, folks, to our justification, the knowledge of our having died with him is indispensable to our sanctification. We are to daily count it as a fact, count it, reckon, daily reckon ourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ. That through our having been identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, we have died to sin, so we died to six things. We died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and even death. Yeah, we died to death. Of course, death means separation. So we've been separated from death. We've been separated from separated. I guess I can say that. We've been separated from being separated from God. That's what it means to... <laughs> have been separated from death, died to death. We've been crucified to sin, self, the law, Satan, the world, and death. Through that identification, that being identified with Christ, which the word is baptizo, baptized is the word. Colossians 3.3, 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And we didn't crucify ourselves. We didn't bury ourselves. We didn't raise ourselves from the dead. It was all done through our identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. No synergism. Our part is to reckon this to be true. And well, I don't want to get into that too heavily. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that um, Christians need to understand this reckoning is, does not require faith because the reason why we reckon is because we don't have all faith. Whatsoever is not of faith, I hope you get this, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And we're to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Reckoning has no relationship to faith. 
God, it, it is reckoning is a is is simply the word simply means to count it as a fact. It's not the word pistuo. It's not the word faith. We count it as true that we died to sin. The word doesn't say believe, exercise faith that you've died to sin. It says reckon yourselves to have died to sin. And the reason for that is that God has made this reckoning, provided this reckoning. It is a provision by God whereby we can put the old man, the old man, the, 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 the sin nature, the, the, the flesh, the, the old man that was crucified with him, we, the, the sin, if, I guess I could just simply state it this way, all of that garbage that you see in your life that is not you, it's of the old man, not the new man, we can count it as true that we died to it. There's, there's nothing, there's no relationship to belief or faith at all. It's because we don't have all faith that that crap is there in our lives. That's what I'm trying to say, and I'm, and I'm afraid I'm not doing a very good job of it. But that's the truth of the matter. Our sins were dealt with by the blood, but we ourselves are dealt with by the cross. It took the cross to crucify us. We have been baptized, dipped, immersed into Christ, identified with him. Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ, Jesus. And then there's the word saved. And, of course, we've been going around and around on this for several weeks now. It's It's been a... I've received a lot of mail uh, concerning this, this 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 distinction between redemption and salvation. The, the the simplest way I can explain this, folks, is that you will see the word "saved" in the context of redemption, because the word literally means rescued, delivered, and so in the in the as, as far as our redemption is concerned. We're very much saved. We're rescued. We're delivered. It's it's associated with our redemption. But most often, you will see the word "saved" used in not in the context of redemption, but you'll you'll see it used in the context of where it's speaking to believers who've already been redeemed, and they need to be saved because redemption is not enough. God didn't redeem us not to save us. He, he saved us when he redeemed us. Now, I hope you don't find that too confusing. The word sozo, uh, it's probably the single most misunderstood in all the Bible, in my opinion. Or at least it ranks up there as me, one of those. Because it's often thought to be synonymous with the word redemption. If you know, if you... If we're talking about redemption, well, we're talking about being saved. And that is absolutely not the, not the case at all. Not That is not true. Even though saved is included in redemption. Saved is most often used in the context of ongoing deliverance from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, death, and all that that we died to, that we were identified with Christ and we died with Christ too. That's what I'm suggesting. Not all who are redeemed will be saved in the sense in which the term is most often used. In, in speaking of the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 3.15, both senses are seen. If any man's work singular shall be burned, non-deliverance resulted in the work being burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, that is, ultimately delivered, rescued, yet so as by fire. That fire being that judgment. The judgment for the believer in Christ. This judgment has no reference, no relationship whatsoever to sin. God's not going to show a, a some horrible, horrifying, graphic movie rerun 
of your life and all of the sin that was in it. The sin issue was settled. It was forever settled at Calvary. There was no deliverance in the progressive ongoing sense because the believer's entire life's work, singular in the Greek, was a result of law instead of grace, flesh as opposed to spirit, works, folks, human performance. They were the result of one's own effort produced by human effort. Reward was was thought to be based on human merit. That's what that's the hay wooden stubble that goes up in smoke. Yet the believer himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire, because God promises salvation to all those who are redeemed. The source of genuine fruit is the vine, not the branch. Christ, not self. And in so many ways, from the Passover, the first Passover, to the Day of Atonement, to more examples than I could possibly cite in one video, without it be becoming hours long, God has made it absolutely crystal clear that we had nothing to do with our redemption, that it was solely by His grace, because if we had had some part in it, it would not have been by grace. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I hope you all are doing well. Thank you for all your messages of letters, your letters, messages, comments, Facebook, YouTube, everything that, that you've sent me for encouragement and support. Until next time, thanks for watching.